In this video, we're going to be talking about how to set up a wind volume so that when the player enters it, we can lock the input and we can actually bring up right there. So you can see you win and I cannot move and we fade to black and then we can give the player more options if we like at that point. So we will walk through how to do that. So in order to implement the wind volume, we need a few different things, but the first thing I'm going to start off with is the text that we see. So we're gonna create that and then we're gonna trigger that inside of Blueprints. We're gonna use the UI system with a widget. So first thing is we're going to right click and create a widget by going down to user interface. You'll see widget blueprint. Uh, just click on user widget, that's fine. And we're gonna type in widget underscore windscreen because we might want additional things on there. You know, it could just be text, but later on we could have images and score and, and whatnot. If you double click the widget up at the very top right, or maybe somewhere different, depending on if this is a newer version of Unreal, you're gonna see a designer view and a graph view. So graph is what we're used to in terms of the event graph and nodes and, and things that we would connect. Our designer view allows us to actually see what it would look like when it's rendered to the screen. So just make sure you're in the designer view, but if you wanna switch between the two, this is how you would do that. So go to designer view, if you're not there already, and we can actually choose these pre-configured um, UI objects and then drag them down into our hierarchy down here to create different types of UI. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff here. There's even more if we you know, expand some of these. We're gonna keep it simple though, uh, with things up here with one exception, and that is the canvas. So I'm gonna type in canvas, and this will just allow us to render things on the screen and then anchor that and uh, control that. If you just drag that in the scene like that, you're gonna see that it'll pop up in the hierarchy down here. You could also drag it down the hierarchy if you like, but just drag and drop it into the scene and that should be fine. Once you have this, we can start putting things in the canvas that will align somewhere inside the screen. Now there's gonna be a lot of things you can do with this and I'm gonna keep it as narrow as possible just so that we can get the wind text. Like UI is not the focus of this tutorial. We just wanna get something to display so you can customize that with other tutorials later. So we have our canvas and then if we want to add text to that, let's clear our search filter and you'll see that text is one of the things that pop up at the top under common, but you could also search for it, right, text. And we're just gonna drag text and drag that down here on the hierarchy underneath the canvas, just like that. So we have our text and we can position this somewhere inside of our canvas. You also see that up here, this is our anchor and you can drag and drop that or you can customize it over here. I think I'm just gonna put these at 0.5, just center it, I think it's simple for now. All right, 0.5, 0 0.5. And then we can posi position this somewhere close. Um, and honestly, maybe we just pull the text up slightly so it appears not directly in the center. And I think that's fine. So the next thing we can do is we can customize the look of the text. And I think I wanna make it a little bit bigger. So if you scroll down, you're gonna see a font right here. You can actually increase the size if you drag and drop like that. I also see that it's not center justified, so you can change the alignment of that as well. And you can find the alignment down here under justification right here, just hit center. And that's fine. You know, you could expand this block over here if you wanna start doing more complex anchoring, but uh, I think this is fine for now. So this is text block. Let's also change this to say you win. Like that. You could always change the color down here if you like. So if we compile and save this, this is the text and the UI that will pop up eventually when we enter the win volume. And so now we need to like figure out how to trigger that and put that on the screen and all that other stuff. So we have our UI set. We just need to know how to make it display in our scene. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to create a win event that can be called, which we can then add the logic to display this. So let's compile, save, we'll close out. And inside of our player controller, uh, again, you need to find out which player controller is actually being used in your map. If you hit the play button and you scroll down, you can see which player controller is being spawned. And if you're using the default, it might, it might be something else and you'd have to put the code there or you can make a new one and uh, plug your new one into the game mode. Just however you need to figure out which player controller you're working in. And we're going to put the win event in the player controller, not inside of the character. So find the player controller that you're working out of. This one's mine, SS player controller. Uh, you can see we already have a reload level somewhere. Let's add a custom event by right clicking and typing in add custom event. We'll call this win. Now in a multiplayer game, this might you know be somewhere else. It might be in the game mode instead of the player controller. It just, it really depends. I'm trying to keep this real simple. So compile, save. This means that anything can call the win event on the player controller 
and it will display the UI and do all the other stuff we need. So let's add that functionality to make that work, and then we'll call it from something else later. Okay, so to take our widget and add it to the player's screen, all we need to do is right click and call something called create widget, and you'll see this pop up under user interface. If we select that, it will ask us for a widget to create. If you click the little drop down, it's looking for the blueprint widget that we created earlier. So you can see widget underscore uh, windscreen. You should see that. If you don't, you may need to save all and save your assets after you created them. So let's connect the execution pin right here. So when we call the win event, create this widget right here. If we wanted to specify an owning player, we could just, you know, if you right click, you can get a reference to self since um, we are in the player controller, if you like. It's single player, so I don't think this will matter, but if you if you did want to do that, you could. Let's compile, save, and uh, create widget. We can pull off of this, and now we have to say we created this particular widget. Now we want to add this particular widget to a viewport. Let's So let's pull off return value. The return value is the widget that we just created, and we'll say add to viewport. And you may only be able to see this if you pull off and then type. You may not be able to see this if you right, if you just start typing like this. So make sure that you pull off right before you type in order to see it. So we create it and add it to the viewport. So then the player should be able to see it whenever we call the win function. So this is our logic and we can do other things as well. We probably want to disable the player's input, for example, so they can't keep running around the scene after they win. So we're gonna pull off and start typing in disable input. And the reason why we can see this is we're also in the player controller, so we would need that anyway, so that's kind of handy. We want our target to be the player pawn, not the player controller, right? We, we may want to be able to reset the level after we win. So when we disable input, we don't want to target the player controller. We want to target the player pawn. So let's right click and say, get player pawn and plug this into the target. Super important, otherwise we'll be stuck and we can't reset. So the character that this controller is controlling, we want to disable that input. And the last thing is we can do a camera fade just to make things a little nicer. Um, in order to do that, we need to get access to the player camera manager. So right click, get player camera manager. There's a couple things that we can get easy access to with these get functions, which is, which is just really handy. You might want to just look up the few that you get access to. Just It's very helpful when knowing what you can find and what you can reference very easily. So we'll pull off of the player camera manager. And once we're pulling off of that, we can say start camera fade. All right. Pull that down connect the execution pin and say we want to go from transparent, so it's our default, to full black by saying one alpha. Duration, I mean, you can do whatever you want. I'm going to put in three seconds just to make it fade a little bit slower. You can choose a color if we like. Hold when finished. I think this would be really important. Make sure that you click this so it stays black after the fade is done and doesn't pop back out real quick. Compile, save, and you know, this is all based off of the win event, but we still need something to trigger it, right? We need to call this from somewhere. You know, if we wanted to test it, we could call it and begin play if we like, but I'm just gonna go ahead and build a win volume that will call the win function. So we'll do that next. Compile, save. Okay, so let's create our win volume that we're gonna put in our scene. Now you could actually have your win event trigger off of whatever you want. Like if you collected this number of collectibles, this time limit, you survived for a certain amount of time or whatever. I'm going to make mine a win volume just to make it very straightforward and um, understandable inside my scene. So to do that, I've done this a few other times in other tutorials, so I'll move a little quick, but you right click, create a blueprint class. A win volume is a type of actor because it can't be controlled by a player. It just exists inside of our scene. So we'll say actor. We'll say BP underscore win volume. I like to save my assets once I create them. So save all, double click. And what we want is we want a box collision to test our overlap, see if it's the player. And if it is, get the player controller and call the win event that we just created. So we'll come over here, we'll say add box and we'll see box collision pop up. And with our box collision, we can compile, save, go over into our event graph. And with our box selected, if we scroll down all the way at the bottom, we can see some events that we have access to. I want the on component begin overlap. You could actually find this by right clicking and you know typing in on component begin over if you want, but it's kind of handy to see all the extra events that you have over here. So I'm just gonna hit the plus button like that. And when something overlaps with this box that we had selected, we want to 
test if the other actor that overlapped with this is the player, and if it is, then we want to do something. We don't want our enemies being detected in the wind volume and triggering that, unless your wind volume was maybe getting an object into the wind volume and then trigger a wind event. You could totally build a, a level that does that. For now, I just want the player to enter the wind volume and we'll test it off of that. So let me right click and say, get player pawn. Right, we can easily get access to the currently controlled player pawn in our level, pull off and we'll say equals equals equal. Right, I'm going to hold alt and disconnect this and plug it into the bottom one just to clean this up a little bit. If our other actor will pull this down into our comparison on one of our two things. So if our other actor is the same as the currently controlled player pawn, so our player character, then we can pull off of this. So our condition, it'll either return true or false. We'll do our branch. That will plug it automatically into the branch node. So connect the execution pin because we want to actually do this, like run the branch node. And we get our condition result from testing these two things. If it's the same, then we want to return true and do other things. If it's not, then you know we don't want to do anything or we can do something else if we like. Instead of pulling off of that, we want to call the win event on our player controller, meaning that we need to get our player controller. Now for me, remember, my player controller is SS player controller. So what we need to do is right click and say, get player controller like that. Now this will get a generic base player controller. So you can see that if we pull off of get player controller and we type in win for a custom event, we're not going to see it. And the reason is because our player controller only knows what it can do from the base player controller class. We created a more customized type of player controller and we want to call this event because ours is a certain type of player controller. We need to cast to it to run the event on this specific player controller. And that's why we're going to cast here. So we're going to pull off of the return value for our player controller, say cast to BP underscore. Yeah, SS player controller like that. We want to run the win event on this specific type of player controller that we made. And that's why we're going to cast. So if the other actors are player pawn, connect true. So if so, we're going to get our current player controller, cast it to see if we are using the SS player controller. If we are, then we want to, again, you can see we can, if we type in win, we see it because we can get access to it like this. I'm just going to connect this just because it's a little cleaner and says, hey, use this one. Uh, it looks like it doesn't matter in this case, but I think this clarifies it a little bit more. Call the win volume after we cast it using this player controller type. Hopefully that makes sense. Casting is a little bit weird to understand at first. So compile, save, drag this over, clean this up a little bit. This is our win volume. If we minimize this, we take our win volume and we drag it into the level. We can press R to scale it out if you like. And we will put the wind volume right at the very end of this little uh, area, just for easy testing. We'll make sure that it's on the plane of our player by going to details and our plane is Y0. I'm using a side scroller. If you had a different game type, it wouldn't matter. But my side scroller is going to be right down this, this plane. So I just need to make sure that I'll intersect with it. So. This should work no matter what your game type is, as long as you put it in the correct player controller. So we have this over here. We have it positioned. We have it scaled. And just to run through the logic real quick, we're going to run across this little level path. We're going to touch this wind volume. We're going to overlap this collision. This collision is going to test, is the player pawn the same as this other actor that just overlapped? If so, look for the player controller, look for our specific player controller with the win volume on it, and then call it. I'm going to double click on this node. Call this win event. And when we call this, we will create the UI widget that we created in that separate widget file, add it to the viewport, disable our player pawns input, and then start a camera fade. So that should be the full logic flow of what we're doing. Let's compile, save, go back and test it. Hit play, run. There's nothing exciting in my game yet. <laughs> if we go over here, you win. We can't control our character. Fades out, it holds, and it displays our windscreen. So we could have stats here, you know, how fast you did it, collectible count, all that kind of stuff if you like. But this is the basics of how you would create a win volume and set that up to work inside of your game.